This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. On October 11th, 2016, five climate activists shut down every pipeline carrying tar sands crude from Canada to the United States. One of them, Michael Foster, is in the state penitentiary in Bismarck, North Dakota. We will talk to the other four as they await their sentencing, and they will give the defense that so far, no court has allowed them to tell a jury of their peers. The Valve Tunas. World politicians barely pretend to contain the carbon monster that threatens our future. Scientists warn us bankers and investors continue to finance the deadly game. But what if we just turn off the taps? Enter the valve turners. These are the people who cannot wait for the system to fail on climate. Their target? Tar sands oil, the most carbon-expensive fossil fuel process on the planet. In Alberta, megacorporations boil or strip mine countless square miles of Canadian land and forest. The Aboriginal people suffer. We have no time to discuss those companies' toxic emissions entering the river's land and air. If you could turn that pipeline off, would you? Some do. We are going to talk with them to hear their voices from the front. Radio Ecoshock. The Valve Turners. First defendant charged with defending the earth, of course, is Leonard Higgins. After retiring with his job from the government of Oregon, Leonard co-founded 350Corvallis.org in Corvallis, home to Oregon State University. In 2013, Higgins was part of a direct action against the tar sands. Well, I'll ask him about that. After another action on October 11, 2016, he was found guilty of shutting down the Spectra Energy Express pipeline in Montana. Leonard Higgins, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you, Alex. Glad to be here. You worked for 31 years for the Oregon government. Frankly, you look like kind of an average guy. You could be my neighbor. What woke you up to social justice for the climate threat? So it it was a gradual thing. It's it's rooted in um, my upbringing in church and a sense of of right and wrong that I was brought up with uh, in my family. The thing that really uh, brought me around the corner, though, was a workshop that I attended in 2007. It was called The Work That Reconnects. It's a lifelong uh, work of Joanna Macy, and um, it describes the need for us to do exactly the challenge in front of us, and that's to change from an industrial growth society to a life-sustaining civilization. And the most impactful part of that workshop uh, was what Joanna calls facing our pain for the world. It's part of the spiral. Um, she has folks start out in gratitude, really getting in touch with all the wonderful things that we're blessed with in this world. And then uh, with that foundation to really start looking at what's wrong. And I think all of us know, even those that are in strong denial, that there's a lot wrong. And there's a, a grieving that actually gave me a lot of energy to actually begin doing something about what's wrong. Tell us about the earlier action in Anacortes, Washington. So you would mentioned the tar sands-related one, and that was in 2013. That was blocking uh, what's called a megalode. It's prefabricated equipment that was bound for the tar sands in Alberta. The action in 2016, uh, I think it was May of 2016 in Anacortes, Washington, was part of the, the worldwide effort coordinated by 350.org to demonstrate the need to keep 80% of the fossil fuel reserves in the ground. There were about 5,000 folks involved in that event. And the part that I was involved in, there were about 300 of us at one point camping on the, the tracks, blocking oil train cars, carrying crude oil to the refineries there, uh, to Soro in a shell refinery. <laughs> it was uh, actually the most wonderful sense of community there on the tracks, uh, people that are willing to put their bodies on the line to stop the harm that's being done. And where does the dirty oil in the Spectra Express pipeline come from, and where does it go? 
It comes from the huge tar sands mining operation in Alberta, Canada, and flows along the Canadian border to the west and comes down into uh, Montana. And um, it's uh, carrying tar sands crude through Montana and to the south to refineries where it's uh, refined into various products. It was one of five tar sands pipelines. All of the tar sands pipelines coming into the U.S. from Canada that our group shut down that day, but it represented about 15% of the U.S. use of crude oil. And what did you do in Montana? Was it hard? Um, it, yeah, that's kind of a funny question. It it was very difficult. I spent my life as a, a law-abiding person. Uh, you know, I was taught that um, my right to do what I wanted ended at the nose of someone else's rights to do what they wanted and not to infringe on others' rights. So I, I'm the last person to consider trespassing on someone else's property, uh, touching their equipment. On the other hand, i do anything, and I am doing all I can to protect my kids' future and to protect my kids' and my loved ones' safety. And so it was hard. It wasn't until I actually finished shutting down the valves after we'd called the pipeline company ahead of time, and they'd basically already shut down the flow by shutting down the pumping stations that I, I closed the valve. It wasn't until then that I really breathed a sigh of relief both in terms of doing what I could to stop the harm and also holding up my end of the work with the the group of us. We were able to successfully shut down all five of the pipelines within an hour. Were you the only one arrested at this particular action in Montana? I was surprised that I was not the only one. In retrospect, I think it was kind of naive to think that with the amount of repression on protests now underway in the U.S., that the person, Reed Engel, that came with me to live stream uh, the action, we live streamed for two reasons. One, if there was any question by the pipeline company that we were there at their block site and prepared to shut the valve, we wanted to be able to direct them to our website so they could see uh, that we were there and identify their own block valve site. And then secondarily, this was planned from the beginning as as a very public act of nonviolent civil disobedience to draw attention to the need, not only to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure, but also to scale back to begin reducing our current use of fossil fuels, reduce the carbon emissions that are creating the climate chaos that we're experiencing. In court, were you allowed to raise the grave threat of the climate coming from tar sands oil? Could you bring that up? No, it was uh, very frustrating. Um, We can talk later about the delight that I have in the allowance of what's called the climate necessity defense in the case of the Minnesota valve turners. But first, Judge Boucher in Fort Benton, Montana, denied my motion to be able to bring the climate necessity defense to talk about the threat that we all face. And he denied it without a hearing. Um, Denied it, I think, with very little consideration. And then In court, I had a legal right to talk about my intent, the way the statute reads for the felony criminal mischief charge that I was being tried on, is that I have to have the intent to create criminal mischief, to do damage uh, greater than $1,500 is the threshold in Minnesota. But each time that I talked about climate change, that I attempted to talk about the climate science, particularly the work of Dr. James Hansen, the prosecutor objected, and I was prevented from really talking about my intent. And very much I was um, prevented from talking to the jury and the judge uh, about the threat of climate change and, and why I did what I did. And 
So uh, th- those will be key factors in our appeal of the conviction. Uh, the appeal, again, is not to get off from the consequences of the civil disobedience. It's to draw attention to the problem. And I hope uh, reach other parents like myself who should by now know that their kid's teacher is threatened. Their, for that matter, the kid's present is threatened. And I know, like me, they'd do anything to protect their kids. And this isn't just a human story about human impacts. I mean, I love the wild. I think you do, too. And all that innocence is threatened by our addiction to fossil fuels, especially the dirtiest ones. How do you feel about that, Leonard Higgins? Well, it makes me want to cry, frankly. Um, and and the, the thing that most of us haven't realized is that we're all connected, whether it's human life or... Um, the rest of the ecosystems, uh, animals and, and plants, and that our lives are interrelated. Our human lives and human civilization depend on the ecosystems in a way that we just have not been in touch with. So as we clear the forests around the planet, as we clear the natural ecosystems, as more and more species disappear, we're threatening our own lives. And all of it is precious. I, I feel as um, sad uh, about the threat to uh, human civilization. We've learned so much in the thousands of years that we've been in existence where we still demonstrate, of course, our human arrogance and human ignorance every day and in the way that we're interacting and the way that um, our countries are posturing towards each other. But there's so much that's precious in our libraries and and in the even the history of our, our own United States. The, the ideals that this country were founded on, if we could live by them, are very precious to me. So, yeah, it makes me want to cry. When is your sentencing, and what do you expect will happen, Leonard? I will receive my sentence from Judge Boucher on March 20 in Fort Benton, Montana. And the maximum that I would receive is 10 years in prison, a $50,000 fine, and court decreed restitution of some thousands of dollars. And it's really uncertain. The judge has complete discretion. Some states have mandatory guidelines that might limit what the judge sentences, um, but that's not the case in Montana. And so there's room for the politics of the situation to influence the judge. It's, of course, my only felony conviction. And so that uh, the judge definitely has to take that into account. Uh, there was a pre-sentencing report done that talks about um, my background and excellent character and that I present no risk to community. And so it seems very unlikely that the judge could sentence me more than a couple of years. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, I might receive a deferred sentence in community service, similar to Ken Ward, Washington State, Valve Turner, his sentence. What message would you like to pass on to our listeners? I, I think that I'll mention my dear friend and fellow Valve Turner, Michael Foster, who uh, just began serving a year sentence for closing the valve in North Dakota. He's in the North Dakota State Penitentiary in Bismarck, North Dakota. Michael has spent something like the last seven or eight years talking to primarily college and high school students about the threat of climate change. He adapted the climate reality presentation that Al Gore and that group created for the younger audience. He also founded a group that began in Germany. He founded a U.S. chapter in Washington State called Plant for the Planet. And he's literally talked to uh, something on the order of twelve to 14,000 uh, young people and adults about the threat of climate change. And his plea to folks as he went into the state penitentiary is that they plant trees. 
if we follow Dr. James Hansen's plan for getting back to a stable climate, for protecting our children, we need to re- reduce the carbon emissions somewhere between 8 and 10 percent per year. Uh, we've waited so long, it, it could have been on the 4 to 6 percent range if we would have started uh, back when Dr. James Hansen first communicated the threat in that plan, it's now 8 to 10 percent. And we need to plant uh, globally at least a trillion trees. Uh, the problem is that we've got 100 and perhaps as much as 150 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere that um, over the next 30 to 40 years will drive the temperature up so that the Earth can no longer support our species and our civilization. And so if we can pull that carbon out with that trillion trees and bring the parts per million to the 350, that is what can support a stable climate, as well as begin reducing our annual carbon emissions, we have a chance to save our children's future. I talked to a scientist on Radio EcoShock who said that when trees first began to spread all over the earth, they did in fact lower the CO2 level and increase the amount of polar ice. So there is some hope. It is a reasonable explanation. I know Dr. James Hansen wanted to testify for Michael Foster, but was not allowed to speak. There's been a lot of muzzling throughout this whole legal system. Our guest has been Leonard Higgins of Oregon. He is a valve turner. Thank you so much, Leonard, for talking with us. Thank you, Alex. The Valve Turners. When I think about the coming climate chaos, I call out, where are the artists? And here they are in action. Emily Johnson is a poet and essayist based out of Seattle, Washington. She published the book Her Animals in 2015 from Hummingbird Press. Emily Johnson, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much. What tar sands pipeline did you help shut down? Annette Klapstein and I were in Leonard, Minnesota, shutting off Enbridge, uh, two Enbridge pipelines, uh, Line 4 and Line 67. How did you learn where they were or what to do? We, as a group, did quite a lot of research in the months leading up to this action. Uh, We wanted to make sure that we knew exactly what we were doing and that it would be safe. And, you know, there there was a fair amount of scouting done, not by me personally, but by my friends. And, yeah, so... Basically, a lot of research, both online and in person. The media in both the United States and Canada, and there was media in Canada, of course, they're our tar sands, so to speak, but they all managed to put that word dangerous in their headlines. Was this a dangerous action? So I have a standard response to that, uh, which is, you know, this is something uh, you know we were very concerned about, first and foremost, the actual safety of it, and then, of course, also this accusation of, of doing something dangerous. But there, there are three main responses that we have to that. And the, the first one up is that these are the emergency shutoff valves. So if you know it is a problem, they, you know they, they, these are designed and these are uh, put in places where they are accessible to first responders, for example, not necessarily pipeline people, in case there's a wildfire or a threat of terrorism or something like that. Um, they are designed to shut this equipment down safely. And as I believe you know, we also made multiple calls to the pipeline companies so that they could shut them down remotely, which they also do. And uh, so if they prefer to do it that way, if that's uh, safer to do it that way, we gave them the ability to do it that way. And in fact, all of them, it it turns out, chose to do that at different uh, moments, uh, you know, after a certain length of time with us uh, turning the valves. And we, you know, there was a pipeline safety expert who testified at Leonard's trial in Montana, uh, made it very clear that that this is what, and I believe the companies themselves refer to it as an unplanned controlled shutdown. Uh, And they do these on a regular basis, you know, for one reason or another. So there was nothing unsafe about it. uh, And we took great, great care to make sure of that. Um, the other thing is that it is the, the only reason that I was still nervous going into the action uh, is that I don't trust the maintenance of these companies. These companies regularly have uh, spills in the normal course of their operations. And in fact, between 99 and 2010, Enbridge had a spill on average every, I think it was four and a half, possibly five days. And those were the self-reported spills. So I'm sure there were some small ones. Uh, that did, that didn't make it into that counting. Um, so it is the daily uh, operation of these pipelines. It is it is the use of them, not the shutting off of them, that is dangerous. Um, and then the other thing is that the most important thing to remember is 
we know uh, exactly how dangerous not shutting off these pipelines is uh, in terms of climate change. Uh, they, they're catastrophic. Tar sands, as I'm sure you're well aware, like coal, is the worst of the worst of fossil fuels. Uh, and it's the form of oil about which Jim Hansen said it's game over for the climate if we keep developing the tar sands. So we simply have to stop the worst, the use of the worst fossil fuels in the very, very, very near future, not decades Ideally, not even, you know, years, but months. And, you know, and coal is struggling on its own for, for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with uh, actually environmental regulations. It's, you know, largely about economics. And tar sands, unfortunately, that's not true of that yet. Um, but we need to stop using them flat out. In a meeting of supporters talking about direct action, you said you went through a door and was never able to come out. That's in that video. It's an excellent video on YouTube. Uh, the, if people just look for valve turners on YouTube, they'll find that. And it's a great meeting. Talk to us about that. You know, the, I mean, the truth is having a deep understanding of climate change and of the urgency of climate change, that is actually really the door through which you cannot come out. You, can, you, cannot, you cannot ever go back through that door. When you understand what the threats are at this moment in time, then you really, you can't unthink those thoughts, you can't unknow that, and it changes your life. Uh, and for me, what that meant, you know, was, and still means, is that I, I devote my life to trying to fight the causes of climate change on a daily basis, and, and 99% of that is you know, wholly legal. Um, you know, I help turn people out for hearings and write letters to their representatives and, you know, make phone calls and, you know, just about everything you can think of in terms of uh, old-fashioned political organizing and protest and so forth. We do that. That's how I spend my days every single day, you know, of the year. But it's also clear that that's not getting us where we need to get uh, because the urgency of climate change is so drastic. And we know that, you know, uh, last June, uh, Cristina Figueres, the former UN climate chief, Looking at, you know, uh, a consensus opinion by many, many, many scientists working with the UN uh, said that we have less than three years to uh, ensure that the catastrophes that we've already started to see are not irreversible. And other scientists have said other things. I've heard two years as well. And obviously, we're already coming up on that and on her number, meaning two years. Uh, so almost heading towards June again. And so we really have very little time before we set off mechanisms. You know, we've probably already set off some feedback loops that we won't be able to control. But, you know, the, the, every, with every day that passes now, we are running the risk of setting off others that would make it impossible for us to stop the processes of the Earth and its atmosphere that would doom most life on Earth. You know, we know right now that the, the you know basically the our options are you know we might lose hundreds of millions of people and five or ten percent of of the biodiversity on the planet um, that is probably the best case scenario uh, tragically uh, at, but we also know at the other end it's you know the last time greenhouse gases overwhelmed the planet it was the end Permian extinction the worst that ever happened it was ninety five percent of life on the planet died out and, and obviously. You know, somewhere in that range, humans will be among among the missing. And this is not tinfoil hat stuff. This is stuff that scientists have been trying to tell us for years. Uh, and, you know, how fast it's coming. Like, you know, obviously we don't, that's not going to start happening in three years. I mean, it will start, start happening in three years. It's already started happening. But the uh, effects of it will not be complete for uh, in the next couple of years. So we have to stop now in order to make sure that we uh, save as many humans and as many species as we can over the course of the next 100 years or so, because we have to be on a path back to climate stability or, you know, basically all hope is lost in, in, the, in the most overwhelming and really unimaginable sort of ways. And, you know, you and I probably won't see that, uh, but uh, our, our kids uh, will certainly see it and, and suffer, and people all over the world are already suffering. I mean, people in Puerto Rico, you know, I believe it's uh, half a million people still don't have power, and this is in the United States. It's completely crazy, you know. And people, and obviously, that's that's not the worst of it either. There are the Syria, Yemen, other countries, low-lying Pacific islands. It is already existential in many, many places, uh, and it and it will be existential for everybody. So we have to do what we can. We have to step up to this moment in time, and. and and that's the door you can't go back. Because once I understood the depth of what we were facing, I also understood that I had to do everything I could uh, to, to prevent it. 
And usually that means taking legal action of many, many kinds and, and a lot of time, a lot of energy and love. But also it does mean civil disobedience sometimes because really throughout you know the last couple hundred years anyway, and, and maybe before that, who knows, nonviolent civil disobedience has been the only thing that has caused rapid, deep changes to systems that seemed completely and totally stuck. So whether you're talking about the abolitionists, whether you're talking about the civil rights movement, slavery, I mean, you know, any number of things, you know, as the suffrage, the way to get deep change in society uh, in many ways is to just completely resist the system nonviolently in a way that other people can identify with. And they may not understand it when they first see it. Like, why would you do a thing like that? Why would you risk going to prison for years? But that's what that opens up a moment where you get to tell them why you would do that and, and, and why, frankly, you think they should too. Uh, and so it's really about unsticking this, the system and making sure that people understand what the risks are of this moment so that they can act uh, in some way rationally uh, in response as well, you know, and whether that's kicking out their climate-denying uh, electeds or whether it's engaging in civil disobedience, understanding that they have to have changes to their, that they'll see changes to their daily lives, you know, many, many of which I think will greatly improve them, you know, that life without fossil fuels will be a much healthier sort of life uh, if we manage to make it happen. Can we call out to other artists to help get this message through? We can call it to everybody. Yeah, this needs to be communicated in every way there is to communicate it. And, and, you know, artists obviously have a really important role to play. Uh, And, you know, I'm feeling sort of hesitant in my response because I'm actually not really writing these days because I'm so focused on this work. And, you know, with luck, I can find a little more balance on that soon. Yeah, every, everybody is needed in every way. And so people may or may not find a, a powerful way to express this in their art, but they can also, you know, help make art for protests and banner drops and things like that. And they can uh, in, engage with their communities just like everybody else can engage with their communities and, you know, have a different kind of voice. And I think it's really important that we have everybody's voice in this fight because we all we all have the same things at stake, even though... You know, many of us in the global north uh, and with some measure of privilege don't face the same immediate risks. Uh, and, and over the longer term, you know, everybody, everybody's voice is really important. Do you think the threat of prison and, and long-term trials has helped or hurt your mental health? <laughs> uh, I would say both. You know, I, taking action at this level and risking uh, time in prison was very important for my mental health uh, because doing something, stepping up in that way and doing something that I believe in so deeply and trying to shake up the system in a way that's different from the way that I try to do that every day, that, that yeah, that's super important to my moral self in this moment in time. And so there's a way, there's been a way in which it's been deeply satisfying. It has also been exhausting. You know, I feel very exposed. I'm a very private person and, and I've had to be very public in response to this. And, you know, we We've uh, I've written articles, we've had articles written about us, we, we have to give these talks and we have to do fundraisers. And of course, it's also, I want to do it because it is about helping people understand why we would do this. And, um, but I do find it uh, psychologically exhausting. Um, and I've been doing that, you know, as I said, at the same time as I'm doing all the work I'm doing with 350 Seattle. And so, yeah, so in that, in that way, it's been hard for my mental health, but it's been good for my, my moral health and my sense of purpose. As we have to wrap up, is there any short message you'd like to leave with all our listeners? Yeah, I guess one of the things I say sometimes is simply, you know, think about like when you're old or when you're dying, you know, whether you have kids or not, what will you wish you had done in this moment? Um, we're not going to get these, these months back, these months and these next couple of years. And so think about what you can give and what kind of time and energy you can expend. And people often worry and feel hopeless and, and think it's too late, but it's never too late to say something, first of all. Uh, and second of all, at this moment in time, those of us who have any time to give and any, you know, energy, the risk of arrest, if we're in a position to do that, all of those things are so important. And, and now is really the moment. Thank you so much, Emily. We've been talking with Emily Johnson, writer, poet, and Valve Turner, currently before the courts in Minnesota. We really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, thanks very much, Alex. Take care. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world.
I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. Ken Ward has been an environmental activist for decades. He led the Public Interest Research Group movement both in New Jersey and nationally. He was Deputy Executive Director of Greenpeace USA and President of the National Environmental Law Center. Now he is a valve turner. Ken Ward, welcome to Radio Ecoshock. Hey, thanks for having me on. It's great to talk to you. Let me know, where did this idea to shut off the tar sands pipes come from? It came from Canada. Folks in Montreal area uh, were the first to do this, and they recorded their efforts, and we were able to watch that on, on YouTube, and that's where the idea came from. YouTube really passes on a lot of things. In fact, there are YouTubes of people actually doing the action that you were arrested for, shutting off the tar sand pipelines. Exactly. I mean, we did it partly to record what we were doing, but we also did it as a safety measure because in at least one example in in Canada, when the folks called the pipeline company to say that they were going to do it, the pipeline company didn't believe them. So we thought, well, we'll just live stream what we're doing, and if there's any question, we can direct them to, uh, to our Facebook page and they can look at it. What pipeline did you turn off and how did it go? Well, personally, I turned off the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, which I run from uh, Alberta down to uh, Anacortes in Washington in the U.S. To do that, I had to uh, cut uh, a lock off a chain link fence and walk onto the property, cut another lock uh, off a chain that was closing the safety block valve, and then manually close the valve. It didn't take very long. Michael Foster said it was rather difficult to turn the valve that he was with. It kind of tired him out and took quite a few turns. Yeah, I've heard him say that, and if you watch the video, you can see that it was a considerable amount of effort on his part. There was a variety of uh, of valves and, and how they operate and how the gearing is and what the volume going through the pipeline is, and his was definitely more difficult. Yeah, there's a, a river of oil running under the ground there, and to stop it, that takes some force, and I, what happens? Does the oil just back up, back to where it was coming from? Well, the intention on our part certainly was to essentially get the pipeline companies themselves to shut down the pipeline electronically from their command center. And that happens. It actually happened in Michael's case as well, but it took them, the, the, that particular pipeline company took the longest to do so. So that is the idea. It is what happened in, in all of our cases. If that doesn't happen, then mechanically you're closing a gate inside the pipeline. Um, that will alert the company, uh, which will then take uh, measures to close down the whole line. Who was arrested with you, Ken? Well, in my case, uh, I had nobody uh, in support. I did have an independent documentary film crew. Uh, Lindsay Grizel and Carl Levine, who were there documenting, and they were both uh, actually arrested. They have since, Lindsay has since completed a, a movie about that action and other works that I've done, which actually opens uh, this week in Missoula called The Reluctant Radical. In that document, you can see, you know, her own experience as, as well as mine of being uh, arrested. She was initially charged with exactly the same set of charges that, that I was. They eventually were dropped, but it was a harrowing experience for them. Will we eventually be able to find the reluctant radical online, do you think? Uh, right now, I guess the way these things work, it's opening at various festivals, film festivals. Uh, I think it's in four or five. Uh, and then afterwards, there will be community screenings. And I think eventually the intention is that it will be available online, yes. So, Ken Ward, you worked with Greenpeace at one point, and I recall the days when the CNN media mogul Ted Turner helped fund the Ruckus Society, and they trained people for direct actions. Do you think the scene for direct action is any better now than it was in the 1990s? Well, uh, first of all, the need is far higher because we're facing, in uh, climate change, we're facing an existential threat, uh, you know, in in Jim Han Dr. Jim Hansen's words, uh, the conditions that make civilization possible on a very short timeline. We need to be doing direct action uh, as well as multiple other kinds of civic activity at a far higher level than we uh, are currently doing it. And we're, we're trying to do this in incredibly difficult political times, especially inside the U.S. 
where there's a wealth of things happening politically and climate is, you know, barely in, in, in the conversation. In a public meeting, you suggested that your friends working in environmental organizations are in a greater existential pain, perhaps, than you are. What did you mean by that? Well, I think that to do a lot of the day-to-day work that environmentalists, especially in mainstream organizations, are doing, you have to deny reality in a not dissimilar way to just flat-out climate deniers are doing. You have to believe that the very small incremental steps um, that you are engaging in can somehow actually address the problem, and that's just not true. And I think I think at some deep level people understand that, and that, that causes a great deal of pain. I wish it was enough pain to change people's behaviors and organizational agendas, but so far that hasn't happened. Were you allowed to express the reasons for your action in court? I was tried twice with two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury, and then the second trial I had a hung jury on one charge and was convicted on the other. In both cases, the judge allowed me personally to uh, explain on the stand why I did what I did, and he allowed me to discuss a little bit the science and the, you know, the, the geophysical basis for the need for action. I was not, however, allowed to put experts on the stand, and I wasn't allowed or my lawyers were not allowed to offer to the jury what's called a necessity defense, where we could have uh, told the jury that they would, it was appropriate for them to find the innocent given the circumstances. And we're appealing. I'm asking for a third trial uh, where I would be uh, you know, allowed to, uh, to offer a necessity defense. So where are you right now in the legal machinery? Are you expecting a sentence? What's going on? Uh, I was sentenced, uh, convicted and sentenced last June. I was given uh, 32 days, two of which I had already served, and then allowed to complete the rest through community service, which I'm just about done doing. I'm working with Habitat for Humanity, building houses in Skagit County, Washington. And as I said, I've appealed, so I am hoping to get a third trial where, uh, as I said, I can offer a necessity defense. Like my friends Emily Johnson and uh, Matt uh, Clapstein, uh, other valve trainers who have been permitted a necessity defense uh, in Minnesota. But we have to be real here. The oil is back flowing through those pipelines. Is direct action a waste of time or is it worth it? I think it's the single most effective thing that we could be doing right now. Why? Uh, well, it raises fundamental questions. Uh, we were able to talk you know, bluntly, brutally about what exactly is the problem and what needs to be done. Uh, we were able to, to you know, call directly for a scale of change that's necessary given the scale of the threat. And it engages people, and I think uh, in a way that uh, ordinary policy activity doesn't. And I think one of the reasons for that is because when you're saying that uh, the world as we know it is in danger, people expect you to act appropriately. And I think that, or we think, that we are acting appropriately in the circumstances, and that gives credence to uh, the message. But when you turn off a pipeline, you're threatening the dollar profits of a huge investment industry and huge fossil fuel companies and They don't like that. And there's a whole set of laws that have been passed in the United States after 9-11 about terrorism. And, of course, the corporations want to label everybody who does even the smallest action as an eco-terrorist. How do we deal with that? Yeah, and we're seeing another explosion of that uh, in the U.S. where a number of states are considering, and some of them are passing uh, industry-written laws to strengthen uh, or to, to increase penalties for p- people engaging in the kinds of actions that we did on, on infrastructure. Uh, so we are seeing a round of that. And 80, 84 members of Congress have written to uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions asking him to prosecute us under federal law. I'm actually not too worried about Well, I think people in, in pretty much understand the difference between terrorism, the point of which is to, you know, create terror, and what we're doing. They may not agree with what we're doing. But certainly none of the juries in any of the places where prosecutors have called us, uh, you know, eco-terrorists, none of them seem to have bought it. I think the way that we conduct what we do, the way we speak, the fact that we simply, that we called the police, uh, called the authorities ourselves and waited to be arrested, I think none of those actions are consistent with what you, you know, what terrorism is all about. And so people are able to distinguish those two things. 
And it looks like governments have been monitoring social media for years, pulling out anything that smells like a threat to business. And sometimes the FBI pretends to help and sets up a sting operation. How can green activists talk to each other about this activism? Well, I mean, in our own case, we made a a kind of a decision early on that we really only wanted to have folks in our, it's not even a group, but in our, our effort who just weren't too concerned, you know, who are, who are basically willing to be transparent in what we did, not in all of the planning, but certainly uh, in our communications, we're just not too worried about it because a lot of what that's designed to do is to make people fearful of the possibility of charges or conspiracy uh, charges being brought. And if you're not worried about those things, then you can feel free to speak, you know, freely, transparently and honestly, as we have done. And we think that's the best way is simply uh, not to worry about it. What kind of feedback have you gotten? Well, you know, it's range. And then, <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going to Missoula and leaving, leaving the day after tomorrow to go speak to uh, groups there. You know, I mean, mostly it's a factor of the society we're currently living in. Most people are speaking to other people who support what they think. So there aren't that many opportunities to go to places where there's a range of opinion you know, outside the courtrooms. But, you know, mostly what we hear is, thank heavens you're doing what you did, what you did. We need more of it. Okay, well, we're going to wrap this up soon, Ken, but I wanted to say, look, if I hand you this microphone, what would you like to tell our listeners? Go ahead, take as long as you need. Talk to us for a minute. I, you know, I, I feel like we're confronted, as I said, with an existential crisis here. We're not really set up to deal with longer-term threats like the one that we're facing in climate change. The world is full of immediate problems that need to be faced, and it's extremely difficult to somehow think about what we need to do to avert a catastrophe that may be years or decades down the line. But in this case, we do face a problem. Uh, we do face a threat that will make uh, you know, life as we know it impossible, and at least some of us need to step outside of day-to-day and take action on that. We don't need a lot of people. We do not No, we need a small number of determined people to do this. So I would encourage people who are deeply concerned, uh, like some of us are, to, you know, move from thought to action. Now is the time. We don't have many years left. Indeed, we are running out of time. From Washington State, we've been talking with longtime eco-activist Ken Ward. Watch for that new documentary about him, and I'll put more details in my show blog at ecoshock.org. But right now, check out the Valve Turner website, Shut it down today. So that's shut it down dot today. And you'll get there and you'll get the latest on this. And also, you can help support the legal costs of these activists. Thank you so much, Ken, for speaking with us. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. Annette Clapstein looks like somebody's grandmother, a kind grandmother. In fact, Annette is part of the Seattle Raging Granny Group. She's a mother of two and a retired attorney, and she's a valve turner. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. Annette, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good. Well, I'm glad to have you. I think you scare the oil industry. If a grandmother can be an activist, anybody can. What got you going down this path of climate activism? Well, I have been an activist for social and environmental justice causes to some degree all of my life uh, since I was a teenager. I worked for the Puyallup tribe as staff attorney for 21 years, so I learned a lot from working with them, and I worked primarily on fisheries issues, so that was um, also by necessity environmental issues. And I read a lot and became aware that Climate change was becoming an issue probably back in the 90s. I mean, it became an issue before that. I think I became aware of it in the early 90s. I think like a lot of people kind of waited for the politicians to deal with it because surely even greedy, corrupt politicians could see that, you know, this would affect them and their children. And time went on and nobody did anything about it. Eventually, you know, I became very, very worried about what kind of future my children and all children and all future generations are going to have, and started becoming very active around that issue. And specifically, the Seattle Raging Grannies 
grannies are a group of older activist uh, women, uh, which there are groups across Canada and the entire United States. And we have what's called an unconvention every two years. And uh, in 2012, we had an uh, unconvention in Victoria, British Columbia, and it's a very loose-knit group with no hierarchy. Uh, People can do what they want as long as it's basically, um, you know, on the left, not the right. You know, we don't usually have resolutions, but at, at that particular unconvention, a resolution was introduced basically saying that climate change should be our top priority, that working for climate justice should be the granny's top priority, because that emergency, if it is not resolved, will foreclose action on all of the other issues that we care so much about. If we do not deal with the climate emergency, you know, we don't have a habitable planet for our grandchildren and we have to deal with it. So the Seattle grannies took that very seriously. We went back to Seattle and initially did a lot of lobbying. We wrote to every conceivable legislative representative at every level from city on up to national and asked for meetings. And we got meetings with some of them and asked them what they were going to do to address climate change. And it became very quickly apparent to us that, you know, we got a lot of nice talk, but no real action. So increasingly, I became aware that we were never going to get this political system to act. And I say that as somebody who worked as a lawyer for almost 30 years. We have a, you know, well, some people would say it's broken. Some people would say it does what it's designed to do, which is to protect capitalism. It does nothing else. It does not work for the people it supposedly represents. You know, we are not going to get any action through that. So it's up to us. And that is the conclusion I came to. And um, I first did a direct action blocking an oil train outside of uh, Anacortes. Uh, There are two refineries up in Anacortes, Washington. Then I brought the grannies into it, and the grannies were involved in a number of actions, including helping to shut down the port of Seattle during the Shell No campaign. We locked ourselves to our rocking chairs and blockaded one of the port entrances, and a number of other groups uh, blocked all the other entrances, so we shut down the port for a day. Were you at the Standing Rock protest by the Sioux Tribe, and how does that connect to the valve-turning action? I was not personally there, but I know a huge number of people from Seattle who were there. I would have liked to be there, but I just did not get the opportunity to go. However, that was going on at the same time as this particular action, the valve turner action, was being planned. And there was a call out from Standing Rock for there to be four days of prayer and solidarity and solidarity with the resistance at Standing Rock, because that, you know, was very much the focal point of resistance to fossil fuel uh, industry at that point. What did you personally do to turn off a tar sands pipeline? Well, for Emily and I, it was slightly different than for the other. All of us, you know, we had it coordinated that we were going to do it 15 minutes apart across four states. And uh, we went with bolt cutters prepared to go inside and actually shut off the valves. But for us, we did, we, you know, cut the chains that held the locks that opened the little doors into the enclosures. We went inside and, you know, we went to turn off the valves, but we had a person back in Seattle who called all of these pipeline companies 15 minutes before you know, the scheduled shutoff. And then we had a support person on site who called five minutes before. And by the time we cut the bolts and got inside, almost immediately, we could see that our particular pipeline was being shut off because there was this giant, this thing that looked like a giant screw, which we could see manually going down and shutting it off. So we knew that it was being shut off remotely. So in our case, our goal of getting them to shut it down remotely actually worked. As a former attorney, how would you describe the necessity defense? The necessity defense is, uh, it comes out of old English common law, where um, the classic example is there is a burning building and there is a child inside and you go to rescue the child and the door is locked. So you break the door down and rescue the child, and afterwards you're charged with burglary. And so the necessity defense is you plead, yes, technically I did do a crime. I did break the door down and break in. However, 
I did it to prevent the death of a child, which is a much higher good than burglary, you know, than worrying about burglary, than breaking a door. You do it to prevent a greater harm, and that's what the necessity defense is. And as I said many times when we've gone around to speak, in our case, the world is on fire and all the children are going to burn if we don't stop it. Are you going to be allowed to present that to a judge? We, uh, our judge in Minnesota did grant us the right to present the necessity defense. However, the prosecutor immediately appealed that. It was heard in the Minnesota Court of Appeals on oral argument this week on February 15th. And our lawyer says he is cautiously optimistic that they may dismiss the appeal, which would mean that we would indeed get to present the necessity defense, which would give us the ability to call in climate scientists and social scientists to talk about, you know, climate scientists to talk about how dire the emergency is that we are in and how quickly we need to turn it around and uh, social scientists to talk about how corrupt our system is and how it does not work for the good of the people. Now, in North America or Europe or Australia, people can decide whether to do a climate action or not. You said that choice itself is a privilege. What did you mean by that? Well, the people who are being most affected by climate change, you know, first and worst, are the people who've done the least to cause it. And they have no choice but to fight it. They have no choice but to fight these companies that are bringing in this death dealing, you know, the pipelines that completely destroy their water, their air, their land. You look at the tar sands, that's why we pick the tar sands, because they're absolutely the worst of the worst on every level. They have absolutely devastated a huge area in Alberta, which is mostly indigenous uh, First Nations Cree people around there. And, you know, they have huge cancer rates. Their water is destroyed. Their land is destroyed. They've taken beautiful forests for miles and miles and miles and just absolutely remove them and turned it into a sea of toxic sludge for literally tens of miles all around. So people who are in that situation where they are literally having their lives threatened in every conceivable way have no choice but to stand up and fight it. I have a choice. I don't think I have a moral choice. You know, to be a moral human being in this time, I have to do everything I can which is why I chose to do what I did. I will do what I have to do to stop it. And I also say that as an old white woman, I am in a better position to take the kind of risky action I took than you know most of my young people of color activist friends, um, because frankly, the police may show up and shoot them. Um, that happens all the time. That is unlikely to happen to me. I may go to jail, but I probably won't be killed for doing something like I did. And also, I have much less to lose. I am retired. I don't worry about having a job. My kids are grown. I don't have a family to support. And I have everything to gain for the young people in the world and and those that will come after them, which is what I care about at this stage of my life. Now, there's no legal remedy for what amounts to a developing mass murder by climate change. Do you think that someday pipeline and oil company executives might be tried for crimes against the planet, or will we have a truth and reconciliation process like South Africa did? Well, you know, if there's any justice in the universe, they certainly would be tried for crimes against humanity. They've known since the 70s. You know, many documents have come out in just the last few years about Exxon and others. They've all known that they are causing climate change, and they've done everything in their power to obfuscate to propagandize people to believe that it's not happening. It's now become so obvious. I think even people who said there was no climate change a few years ago are admitting, well, wow, look at Houston, look at Puerto Rico, look at the kind of hurricanes we're having. For us in the West, on the West Coast of the United States and British Columbia and Canada, what we saw this last year was a wildfire season completely unprecedented beyond anything we've ever seen. Yes, we always have wildfires, but for the first time ever, and I'm 65, I'll be 66 in June, we had weather forecasts in Seattle that were day after day smoke. That was the weather forecast, smoke. The wildfires in the mountains and all up and down the coast and inland were so bad that we had ash dropping out of the sky day after day. We had to wear masks. That's what we're facing, and it's only going to get worse. 
We've already got about 40 years of climate change baked into the system. There's a 40-year delay on a lot of it. It stays up there, plus what we've been adding in the meantime. So we're, we're too late for a good outcome, but we're not too late to choose between a bad outcome and an apocalyptic outcome. And that's what we're fighting for at this point, is to save as much as we can for future generations. When will your case be tried, Annette, and how can people support you and the other Valve Turners? We don't yet know when our case will be tried. We've been told that the Court of Appeals will make their decision by May, sometime in May. Um, and it could be sooner, but it's likely to be May. After that, uh, assuming that they rule in our favor, well, either way, I guess, um, it will go back to the trial court, and they will set a date for trial. So we are assuming our trial will be sometime this summer. That's that's the likeliest, but we don't have a date yet. And, you know, we just had Michael Foster get sentenced to uh, three years in prison in North Dakota. Two were suspended, but he is in prison right now in North Dakota. So we have a lot of legal expenses, and one of the things people can do is contribute to our Legal Defense Fund. We really appreciate that. If you go to either our website, shutitdown.today, or our Facebook page, which is called Climate Direct Action, it's shutitdown-climate-direct-action. Either one will direct you to our Legal Defense Fund, and uh, we really need people to contribute. Beyond that, we would love to have people come out to our trial. think, you know, any of us who get jail time would probably welcome visitors if people happen to be in those areas. We don't want people to commute long distances to visit us, but people who might be in the States, we'd be serving time and we'd love to have visitors. And um, we hope that people will go out and get active. That is the most important thing. This is a, you know, the emergency of not only our lifetime, but really of humanity's lifetime. If we don't turn this around, we are in a world of hurt and people need to look beyond their comfort and convenience and do everything in their power to put a stop to what the fossil fuel industry is doing to our planet. Uh, They really are. They're the real criminals. Uh, We don't see ourselves as criminals, but we certainly see them as criminals. From Washington State, we've been talking with Valve Turner Annette Klapstein. As she says, find out more at the website, shutitdown.today. Thank you so much for talking with us, Annette. Thank you. The Valve Turners. We just have a little time to hear why climate activists must not be silenced about the dire necessity of taking action now. This is a recording of the oral argument for the defense in the Minnesota State Appeals Court in February 2018 by lawyer Tim Phillips. There are four elements on this that are spelled out in State versus Ryan, and I'll go through them briefly. First, whether the harm that would have resulted from obeying the law would have significantly exceeded the harm actually caused by breaking the law. Here, the greater harm that respondents were targeting was not merely government policy that they disagreed with, but an ongoing catastrophic series of harms from climate change. The action was not merely symbolic. In in coordination with other people, all tar sands oil entering the United States was shut off at the same time. Any harm from respondents' action, which simply involved breaking chains, securing the site with a bolt cutter. Any harm from that was superficial in comparison to the harms of climate change that respondents sought to prevent. The second element is whether there was a legal alternative to breaking the law. The scientific consensus is we are living in a climate emergency. If lobbying or lawsuits or other legal alternatives were capable of adequately addressing this emergency, they would have resulted in some meaningful legislative change climate policy, and so on, before this emergency spun out of control, as it has. Respondents do not need to rebut every conceivable alternative. The third element under Ryan is whether respondents were in danger of imminent physical harm. Climate change is currently occurring, harming people in every part of the world. It's harming people through superstorms, floods, heat waves, droughts, wildfires. The list goes on and on. And in Massachusetts versus EPA, the United States Supreme Court found that the EPA's refusal to regulate greenhouse gas emissions was an, quote, imminent harm to Massachusetts in light of the wealth of negative effects, including sea level rise and so on, that result from climate change. Respondents, like the rest of us, are in danger of imminent climate change harms. And the last element is whether there was a direct causal connection between breaking the law and preventing the harm. 
respondents' actions, again, collectively with others, shut down tar sands pipelines, which are, according to the EPA, significantly more greenhouse gas intensive than other crudes, have potentially large climate impacts with emissions that could be 81% greater than emissions from the average crude refined in the United States. There couldn't be a stronger necessity case involving political issues than this one. That was lawyer Tim Phillips arguing to the Minnesota Appeals Court on behalf of the Valve Turners, Annette Klapstein and Emily Johnston. Find out more about these brave climate activists in my show blog at ecoshock.org and at their website, shutitdown.today. I'm Alex Smith. Thank you for listening and caring about our world.